and we are live. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone. So, as um, I so often say, would, um, apologies there. Um, the, the, a little bit of feedback there. So, the, um, the welcome to the March ENSO seminar and. Uh, March uh, 2019 and September, which will be presented by Hannah de Jacke, um from the University of the Basque Country. Um, and um, so we will, as is our um, normal practice, we'll give ourselves just a, a couple of minutes to um, sort of settle in, uh, allow other members of the seminar to join us over time and um, to give people uh, a, a few minutes watching live and to start and picking up the broadcast. Um, I've had the, the pleasure to know Hannah since um, the early 2000s, um, it is, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so the we both did our uh, doctoral research in the, the same institution at the University of Sussex, uh, where Hannah um, initially developed um, a number of um, her ideas, including um, that of participatory sense making, which I think is probably your your blockbuster um, of the sort of the many aspects mm -hmm. of your work, mm -hmm. the one that um, you will perhaps uh, know best. So you, you moved from um, the the University of Sussex to the University of the Basque Country in uh, 2007, was it? No, I moved first to Heidelberg. Um, oh, okay. Pardon, yes. Yeah, and that was in 2008. No, yeah, 2007, and then uh, in 2010 to the University of the Basque Country. Yeah. So with Thomas Fuchs in Heidelberg and then mm -hmm. uh, to the, the, the center in the last country. Mm -hmm. um, so the the um, seminar you'll be giving today will be on um, some of your most recent work, which you're also developing into a book. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm looking forward to that. So the just as we wait for uh, one or two of the others to, to join us, um, I wanted to give a sort of a quick bit of news. Um, so I will briefly share my screen here. Um, that, that's probably a little bit confusing. Um, so the um, um, the just to to um, to make people aware, I guess, of a new open access journal that might be relevant to the ENSO community at large. Um, which is the philosophy and the mind sciences. Uh, the philosophy and the mind sciences is uh, an open access journal with uh, without publication fees, um, uh, dedicated to research at the interface, as they say, between the philosophy of mind, psychology, and cognitive neuroscience. The editorial board includes the likes of Michael Anderson, Ned Block, Olivia Carter, um, David Chalmers, Andy Clark, Daniel Dennett, um, Carl Friston, uh, Fiona McPherson, um, Evan Thompson, Dan Zahavi, so the, there's a sort of wide range of people there um, and it seems like the, the kind of venue that uh, members of the ENSO community would probably do well to um, spend some time uh, interacting with. They have mm -hmm. um, a call for papers out at the moment, which will be their first issue, a special issue, um, on radical disruptions of self-consciousness mm -hmm. um, and the, the, uh, there's a CFP for that in the um, uh, submission deadline is the 30th of April, so um, that will be, uh, yeah, I think that's quite likely going to be quite, quite a, become quite a substantial venue for um, philosophy of cognitive science and the philosophy of mind over the next few years. Mm. Certainly worth knowing about. Yeah, it looks very really nice. So um, we have a... Um, Okay, we can give people a few more minutes to um, to join in. So, um, but I think we have a, a few people watching live now, and I think at this point, Hannah, um, we'll allow people to to sort of join as they come. So they'll yeah. um, they'll they'll be quiet and polite as they join in. Okay. Sure. So I will um, invite you then to. Uh, present the March 2019 ENSO seminar, Loving and Knowing Reflections for an Engaged Epistemology. Okay, <laughs> good. So here's the point where we switch. Um, 
Oh, I still have, I have to first go to screen share. Yes. Okay, and then. Perfect. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. So yes, um, loving and knowing reflections for an engaged epistemology. Um, I should say first what I will do, and that is that I will um, wonder a little bit whether in the cognitive sciences we investigate really our most sophisticated forms of human knowing. And um, I will give a few examples explaining why I think that can be questioned. And also I will say what we should study, I think, uh, instead, or at least we should definitely involve studying some aspects of our human knowing that we have been neglecting so far in cognitive science. Um, and then I will uh, say a little bit about participatory sense making, but very briefly, because I think most people watching this probably know about it. And then, but I also talk about participatory sense making and an active cognitive science more in general, because what I think we are doing with an active cognitive science is actually moving towards investigating what I call human knowing. Um, so this part of knowing or this way of knowing that has been ignored in cognitive science for a long time or for a lot of it. Um, and so I think we are moving there with an active cognitive science and particularly with participatory sense making. And I will explain why I think that. But at the same time, I think there's still something missing there and we need to go a little deeper than we've been going so far, or we need to understand something else in order to really um, get a grip on what is this human knowing and what is at play in it. And so what I'm doing today in this talk is to give a, to, to present a proposal for investigating this human knowing with a kind of tension that I think there is in loving and in love relationships. So we can look to love relationships, I think, to understand human knowing better. And that's the proposal of today. So that's um, basically the, yeah, what I'm going to talk about. And in the end, I will also say a little bit about where I think this kind of approach can go in terms of things we can investigate. Um, so yes, first, um, what the mind sciences try to understand, I think we can say very broadly and very quickly is, computational cognition. And by that, I mean, um, we have a kind of idea of the things we need to understand most when we think of human cognition is things like language and mathematics and planning and decision making, uh, or high intelligence or, or human intelligence. And we um, tend to look at that with a kind of computational eye or a computational inspiration or imagination. We frame things in terms of how we know computers work when we think about human cognition, and I think that's misguided. Um, it can, we can discuss this a bit more in detail, but for now, this is what I want to say about it. Um, but I wonder if these really are our most sophisticated forms of knowing. Um, and I'm going to explain this with some examples. Um, so we can ask what really are our most, our most sophisticated forms of knowing? And so one example comes from the area of dementia and dementia care, where in more traditional approaches in cognitive science, like in psychology, we can imagine that um, dementia is to do with, or at least in dementia care, what is at play are emotional skills, emotional capacities. And traditional psychology tends to look at emotional skills as something that is to do with categorizing emotions. So categorizing, um, pictures of people showing emotions in, in terms of happy, sad, and so on. And already here with this picture, now that I look at it uh, on my own screen right here in front of me, I realize this is maybe not such an easy emotion to categorize. And so that is th that kind of approach of categorizing emotions has many problems. But one of them is that in the area of dementia care and dementia understanding, when you think that um, emotional skills are mainly about being able to categorize emotions and you then test people with dementia and find that they cannot categorize emotions anymore. You might think that they lose their emotional skill and their emotional capacity. But when you are in contact with people with dementia, when you know them closely, then um, what you know is that you can interact with people with dementia quite um, in quite sophisticated ways. You may have very close connections with them. You can help them with everyday tasks like uh, cutting their nails, like you can see in this picture. 
Um, and this, or you can just sit together watching the birds go by. And this is a very close emotional connection where you can still have a fine interaction with, with, with a person with dementia. So to think that emotional skills go away just because you cannot categorize emotions is a mistake in this case, because if you believe that this will influence your relations with people with dementia in a way that will make you less able to communicate with them, to interact with them in a sophisticated way, than what you know as a person when you interact with them. So there is a kind of human knowing to interacting with a person with dementia, which is close and, and sophisticated, which we might lose if we look at it from a traditional psychology point of view. And another example is um, in prison systems in the UK and in the US, um, there is an approach to prisoners that uh, tends to want to control them and um, um, maybe re remediate their um, criminal ways by putting them in solitary confinement or um, by um, um, giving them very um, harsh materials uh, circumstances and also by prison guards being quite authoritarian and the whole system being based on, on um, um, an approach that actually um, puts prisoners apart and determines them in a way that um, makes it hard for them to get out of um, the criminal system, in fact. Um, and so, um, um, in a way, they are um, in, in such a system in the UK and in the US, um, there's a lot of recidivism. So people, prisoners in this, in this kind of system are not really treated as, as humans as they would be, for instance, in a Norwegian prison system where um, the main difference would be in the Norwegian system that guards are actually trained to be companions to the prisoners, to a way, a way out of prison. And this really works. I mean, guards are, um, have a very different relationship with prisoners and they um, actually manage to uh, have much less recidivism in such a system where the person is more recognized. Um, and so it's easier to imagine getting out of that system. Um, another example of, I think, a very sophisticated forms of knowing that are ignored by a Western approach is, uh, is to do with the issue of First Nations land rights, treaties and negotiations where um, governments, for instance, in Canada, um, have so-called negotiations and treaties with First Nations people. Um, but actually, you can see a kind of negotiation as, as a, um, an interaction between two parties. But this is a negotiation that's completely determined by the Western view of legality and so on, um, where negotiations aren't actually negotiations or treaties because one part, the First Nations, are not even recognized in their way of knowing the land, which is related with how they deal with it in the, through their, um, yeah, what we call embodiment in, in an act of cognitive, in an act of science, of course, but which is a, an, a knowledge of the trees and, and uh, the land um, and a connection to the ancestral spirits that are present in the land or um, in, in the country. Um, and this, is not even um, recognized in the treaties and negotiations. So it's not really a treaty properly because one of the parties, the knowing of one of the parties is not properly recognized. And so this, I think, shows that there is a kind or there are many different kinds of human knowing that we know very little about still in the mind sciences. And because we know so little about them, it's also difficult to encounter them or to see them in the mind sciences. So this is kind of a double problem. Um, and this problem has implications, um, the, and the implications are mainly for how we treat each other in all our relationships, from societal to intimate and anything in between. So basically it has implications for living and for living together. So if we are concerned with making a science of human knowing, we need to be very careful with recognizing it properly. And so this kind of human knowing Practitioners of all kinds, doctors, teachers, therapists, brothers and sisters, family members, farmers, coaches, you 
me, we know it very well. Humans know it very well, just by virtue of being humans, of, of having this intersubjective experience that we all have from the beginning of life. Um, and so I think we can, I, I would like to make a contrast between two pinnacles of knowing, of human knowing. And the one of traditional cognitive science is kind of abstract, computational, it's logical, it's reduced, um, it's also very individual and technological. It's hegemonic because in a way we tend to think that we have a grasp on universal cognition with this idea, but actually it's based on a false idea of universality. And it's also quite utilitarian. And I think we can look at a different pinnacle of cognition, and this is our human engaged knowing, which is always concrete. It happens in particular um, specific situations. It's engaged, it's risky, it's participatory. We participate in knowing each other and in knowing the world. And this means that it involves yourself deeply. So you engage, this participation is something that you do yourself with the thing that you are knowing. So it involves yourself. It's situated, it's always in a particular context. And this makes it inherently ethical because it's to do with values of um, a knower in interaction with the world. So this is always to do with um, ethics of engagement. And so I think this is, like I said in the very beginning, what an active cognitive science is moving towards, towards understanding this. And so um, with participatory sense making, I think we are moving towards that, understanding this human knowing, because we try to understand interaction processes between people and how they influence and co-determine the intentions of people. So participatory sense making understands intersubjectivity or our, what we do in our social lives as the interplay between interactive and individual autonomies and sense making. And so we propose that people literally participate in each other's intentions by moving together. And in this, not just the person and their intentions play a role, but also the interaction process as we've defined it as um, a system that can take on a life of its own and influence individual intentions. So there is a tension in participatory sense making between um, the individuals that engage in an interaction and the interaction itself, which generates its own norms, if you like. And so people participate and are confronted or meet with or, or meet each other, but they also are having to deal with what an interaction does with them. And this is the primary tension in participatory sense making, which I think goes a little bit towards the tensions in human knowing, as I will keep explaining it during the rest of the talk. Um, so participatory sense making, um, in, uh, just to say briefly how I think of doing this work, I think what I'm doing, if you think of it as a tree, what I'm doing is mainly developing the core concepts together with many other people um, who are not all listed on this slide. Um, so um, developing the concepts is important. Um, well, we do it on, also on the basis of many uh, thinkers who came before us uh, or and also contemporaries so it's quite an embedded uh, embedded approach um, and at the same time what's very important to me and and um, also to people I work with is that um, we can apply and test these ideas and this means that we um, go to different we, we, we talk not just to people in philosophy but also to people in psychology linguistics psychiatry, psychopathology, sociology, neuroscience, um, and also meanwhile, the arts um, and therapies, all different kinds of therapies, um, in order not just to test these ideas um, scientifically, so to, to make hypotheses in, in neuroscience, for, into, for instance, and to see what actually is the influence of interactive experience on neural development, for instance. But also um, what is important to me is that we uh, apply or take these ideas out into the world where people are actually meeting and they are in actual situations of dealing with each other also with lots of um, inherent difficulties like for instance dementia care or the prison system or um, negotiations between people who have vested interests which are very different so um, all these applications and testings and so on um, 
are also now this uh, just something I want to mention. Something that's going to come soon is um, um, a way to visualize what's been happening with the idea of participatory sense making in terms of uh, how people have taken it up in different areas. And together with um, my PhD student, Enara Garcia, and Thomas Burman, who is now working at a, a company that does a data visualization, um, we will present um, a kind of resource to look at um, how the idea of participatory sense making has been taken up and what are the uh, links in different fields that are being made and how, um, in a way, what is the application of it, not so much only in terms of testing it in different sciences, but also in um, what the concept can do in general and, and um, what questions uh, are relevant for it, what are the things that we need to look at next with participatory sense making and so on. So this is something that will come out soon. Um, I will keep you informed on that. Um, we Lots of things have, ha have been happening with it. So Linguistic Bodies recently came out. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk more about that here. I have to keep track a little bit of time as well. We also recently um, published a paper on diversity computing together with Sue Watts, Fletcher Watson. And she's a psychologist and Yella and Christopher um, and uh, they are design researchers and also computer scientists. And this is a, um, a paper in which we think about how we could think, um, um, think te technologies so as to help make interactions between people from diverse background better without um, uh, assuming that there is a normative framework for doing this, but rather how a technology can help question um, how people can participate better. So opening up ways of participating, inviting ways of participating through technology that um, open up to differences rather than help put people in boxes, which is what um, technology tends to do these days. So we want to kind of um, give a conceptual shift to this idea of, of um, biases in, in um, technology for, for interaction. Um, and another thing is the phenomenological methods that we've been developing in order to um, unfold and see what happens in, in the experience of interacting. And all of these things, I think, contribute to making a, a cognitive science of human knowing. But um, I still think we need to look a little deeper into what's going on because um, this has several reasons, the need, this need for a deepening of the idea of participatory sense making, because um, practitioners, when they hear me present this work, they think it's, um, they often like it, but also sometimes they say to me, is it really necessary or is this, isn't this self-evident? And I think this speaks to their human knowing. They know um, um, how to engage with humans in, particular situations and they recognize that in what I'm telling when I speak about participatory sense making. But at the same time, I don't think it's yet self-evident because um, in cognitive science we really haven't um, captured this aspect of knowing. And it's also clear um, in handbooks for teaching, for instance, or for um, psychiatric diagnosis, for instance, in a handbook, you won't find described the kinds of things that humans do um, and that contribute to how we know, for instance, when a person is presenting with depression um, or something like that. So there's, it's still, um, it's present in our practices, but in our handbooks and in our theories, it's not yet so present. So I think for that, we need to deepen um, our thinking in the inactive logic rather than going with what sometimes happens, then going to um, uh, computational or, or representational concepts. Again, the so-called representation hungry problems. I think actually we need to think these um, on an inactive logic and take that further. So that's what I, I'm aiming for. And I think for that, we need a different epistemology and this uh, different epistemology, I think, can be built on the idea of letting things be, which is an example, or which is, sorry, an idea that I'm going to explain further. Um, I found it described in a paper by philosopher 
Kim McLaren. And um, she talks about, she gives in the paper an example that's very illustrative of this problem. She says, imagine a horse trainer who is training his horse and training it and training it. And his interest with the horse is to make money. And so he trains it very hard. But in the end, the horse gets very tired and breaks down. It becomes ill um, and it just breaks down. And this is because the trainer has been um, putting the horse in his frame of reference and doing with it what he needed with it from his idea of uh, making money with it. But he, with this, he has overdetermined it and thereby broken it down in a way. And he has not recognized a horse in its hoarseness, in its need to roam and play and be um, the particular animal that it is. Um, and so he has not balanced his interest in the horse with um, what the horse is. And so his relationship with it has um, broken down. And this example, says Kim McLaren, shows that we need to learn how to let things be because we can do it wrongly and she says the main place where we learn it is from letting others be so in our in our intersubjective lives and encounters and so she uses the concepts of intercorporeality and intersubjectivity from Merleau Ponty to explain this and she says in intercorporeality we um, em share an embodied world um, we act on things through others. So the example that Mila Ponti gives is watching a soccer match and you um, see the players on the field and you are engaged with them. You understand what they are doing by being a spectator, but also by being on the field with them in your body or almost in their body. And um, by this vicarious um, presence with them, um, which he calls intercorporeality, your body is here and there at the same time. And you know the world through um, seeing someone else doing something by being in what they are doing um, in their body. And so intersubjectively, we also mutually situate self and other, uh, ourselves and, and each other um, in reference to each other. So for instance, think of a teacher teaching someone to surf if they do that well, they will situate um, the student and themselves rightly. That means they will see what the student is already capable of and start teaching them at that place rather than at a different place where the student is not at. And that would be a good mutual situating of self and other. So there is this mutual embodied letting others be, and this is an active project of, of uh, letting others be. It's something that we have to actively take up and engage in. Um, and so this different epistemology lets the phenomena, so things, events, people, situations, it lets, it, it's about letting the phenomena be, which is always something that we do over against and also at the same time with our own knowing them changing the phenomena. So the phenomena are always um, balancing or, or moving between what they are and how they are known. The phenomenon is always, um, yeah, balanced. It's a, or not balanced. It's an ongoing balancing, in fact, uh, and they are never really finished doing that. Even though here on my screen they turned upside down, but maybe that's also helpful to think that um, thinking the phenomena like this turns it upside down a bit, and it means that yeah, there's an ongoing, continuing, continue, continuing balancing act going on. So letting be, remember, I'm talking about this in the, um, here in the context of epistemology. So if you hear let it be or letting something be, you might think that you leave it alone, but that's completely not what I mean here. Um, letting be is not a disengaging and it's also not, so it's not letting something be over there and not, um, not having, a, um, not engaging with it. It's also not overdetermining it. Overdetermining it would be having too close of a relation with it so that you put your intentions onto it too much and thereby also break it down. So letting be always veers between um, um, uh, letting the thing be in terms of leaving it as it is, but not so much that you don't have a relationship with it anymore because then you wouldn't know it. And it also doesn't mean 
um, determining it so much that your knowing it breaks down its being, like with the horse. So letting be is always engaging, but it also means that it's always paradoxical and ambiguous because it's an interaction in which both known and knower continually change. So we know this in um, science and in philosophy and in thinking, I think also from some people who have done this and who have like Jane Goodall and who have really shown or, or given insights that went beyond what an objective science could show or a purely rationally objective science could show. And also, um, and this is um, an example that I got from Ezekiel, he's more an expert on this, um, how Gilbert Simondon showed that in interaction with technology, even in interaction with technology, there is a, a, an engaged knowing in which uh, we understand machines and how they behave um, in a quite close relationship. And this allows us to understand them better and to take some aspects of it more seriously. Like for instance, we do also with the example of diversity computing. Um, we don't, it's, it's not a matter of taking technology at face value or leave, or kind of trusting that it will do its thing if it's objective. Um, because technology isn't objective because it's made by people for people and we have to be quite careful in seeing what it actually does interacting with it and then trying to modulate that interaction so that it really um, represents and does justice to what we need from it and that is to better interact with each other anyway this is more about diversity computing now but yeah um and another example an example of, of, of this loving knowing uh, can be found in uh, research that looks at interactions between autistic people and their caregivers or their parents. So I want to give a particular example here. There are more people doing this kind of work, but this example from Laura Sterponi and her um, a group of people. Um, here, um, they have written a few papers in which they look at interactions between an autistic boy and his parents and tutor at home. Um, and they look at it through uh, an interaction analysis or conversation analysis framework. And this means that they take into account the whole context of what's happening in an interaction. And they look particularly at echolalia, which is the repetition of um, um, things that somebody or they themselves said before. And uh, echolalia is something that's sometimes taken up as being meaningless um, and just to be ignored. But many people, including these researchers, have shown that echolalia is actually meaningful. And one of the examples is um, a little boy, Aaron. He's um, uh, standing on the balcony overlooking the garden and his mother is sitting also near him. And she's kind of in a pedagogical frame of mind and she asks him to say what the gardener is doing and she expects a full grammatical sentence at the right level of detail of what work is and so on. And um, Aaron, the little boy, um, is kind of aware of what she's asking and he's um, answering not completely immediately but a little bit. Um, and he, so they go back and forth or the, the analyze, analysis of the dialogue is that, that they go back and forth between the mother asking this question and Aaron um, kind of saying something to the question, but also at some point saying um, or bringing in his favorite topic into the conversation, which is germs. Um, and his mother, rather than um, blocking him or punishing him for this, she goes along with it and she says, oh, you would like germs, okay. And then, um, after a while, they keep going like this and they laugh and play. And in the end, Aaron does produce the grammatical sentence about what the gardener is doing. He's watering the plants in the garden. And so there's this um, playing here with expectations, with language, with connection, and also with um, answering what the expectation is of the mother. And Aaron does it, but he does it through detours in which he brings in his own interests as well. And that um, shows quite a sophistication in, in interaction, which maybe with, we, we don't expect of people with autism from a traditional framework of understanding what autism is. And also maybe if we, if we were to look at this from a theory of mind perspective, we would say that 
the answers he's giving for a long time are wrong. And actually, it's very sophisticated inter internationally. Um, and here's another example. Let me just check the time. Um, maybe I won't go into this example, but it's quite similar. I mean, here you see that Aaron, where the arrows are, um, Aaron says you're looking at the brick stove. It means they are not really connecting when he's looking at something else and they, they are, in fact, mom is expecting him to look at her. But you can see that Aaron turns rapidly away from her and then back to her. And then they um, interact about whether they are together or not. And they do this turning away from each other, turning back. They laugh and they, they enjoy this play of connecting in what they literally say and also in their, embodied, in their embodiment, in their moving and in their participating together in this interaction. Um, so this shows that um, here um, something is going on between two people where they um, um, let each other be how they are and yet they also are able to bring out quite a lot in each other or the Aaron is, is able to, to um, engage and be um, to more of an extent than if we were to look with a traditional lens. And so I think, so here obviously it's a mother loving her son and she um, is also not doing that naively. She wants to bring out things from him and, and, and she pulls on him and yet she, also, she does that sensitively. Um, and we as researchers can also do that if we extend our method to looking at a whole context of, what, of how a person is behaving, what, why they are behaving in a particular way, what their interests and their concerns are in this interaction, which is very beautifully interested, inter, um, um, exemplified in these papers. Um, so we can do a loving knowing as researchers too, which means that we have the kind of the right kind of um, distance and closeness to the topic we are investigating so that it can be itself. Um, and we, yeah, we engage with it properly for that. So this idea of loving and knowing, um, we also find it in the work of Jessica Benjamin and uh, of Carol Gilligan, among other people. Many other people have actually written about it. But Benjamin says, for instance, that um, recognizing another and being recognized by another is something that happens in a tension. It's a continual ongoing tension and it's difficult. And we have to hold or contain this tension and not let it go in a way in order to be fully recognized. And fully, being fully recognized is never finished because we keep changing. And Carol Gilligan says that um, we, um, in relationships, um, we have to have a strike a balance between being present and participating, having a voice, and also being in relation. So our voice and our presence being modulated by the relation. Um, yeah, just to say it very briefly. Um, so I think that this human knowing we can we can find it in love relationships because they are the place where everybody finds and lives these dynamics of engaged knowing and the inherent tension of recognition that we must hold, as Benjamin says. So I think an engaged epistemology has its paradigm case in these love relationships. Um, and so to understand this better, we need to better understand the interactive and the individual normativities and self-organizations at play. So here, I think we can fold back to participatory sense-making because I think that the concepts and the, the framework of it will help to to um, put what I what loving is this tension um, into concrete terms that we can then investigate. So, what knowing loving can illuminate about sense making, I think, is our deepest involvement as precisely the beings that we are in those that we know, people, things, events that we are interested in knowing, and in this process of understanding them. And only if we understand this involvement can we begin to understand our most sophisticated forms of human knowing, I think, the ones I talked about in the beginning. So um, this may raise some questions, actually, some buts. Um, so one but might be what is essence or truth or fact in this approach? Is everything then just fluid? No, that's 
not really what I mean. Um, I think essence, fact, and truth are relational. We, we know things in relation. And these relations are always particular encounters between a knower and a world in a particular moment in time or in an epoch. So what happens in these encounters when we are knowing something can be tested or verified by others, which is one way in which we can verify uh, truth or fact. And this is important. And we have all kinds of methods for that. So this um, would be going towards an idea of objectivity in terms of intersubjectivity. But more than this, we can expect that essences and facts and truths are things that are never finished and that are continually changing. And yet they are tangible and real within particular circumstances and within particular engagements. And so we can have particular engagements here and now today, but we can also have these particular engagements in science, for instance, knowing astrophysics, um, where these engagements are ongoing for a long time, or, or we know something that um, is a scientific fact that remains the same for a long time, and yet also there um, we can see change in our ideas. Um, so another but is because I talk about love, is this a rosy picture? Because of course, um, when I talk about loving, your first idea might be of a kind of romantic cultural idea of love relationships. Um, but this is also not what I mean. Um, I'm after something quite specific about loving and defining it in terms of this letting be, this balancing act uh, means that it's never finished. Loving uh, is never finished because knower and known and lover and loved are never finished. We are always ongoingly becoming. Um, and as such, we engage with each other. And this, is, this means that there are also a lot of tensions and difficulties in this. And so it's not a rosy picture of, of a romantic idea of love. Um, it's rather an ongoing tension that animates our lives and it never lets us go. We neither are, are let go in this um, dialectic. And so it's a continual, inescapable, moving dialectic, this idea of loving or knowing as loving. And so this is um, when, when we look more deeply into this forest of um, trees now, not just one tree, I think, um, the forest looks back at us and we have to in that confrontation, we can find out something more. And so here on, with this slide, I want to talk just briefly about, um, it's almost uh, finished, I'm almost concluding. I want to just briefly say something about where this idea can take us with an act of cognitive science, because there has been a, a little bit of a buzz going around um, in an active uh, thinking that we need to take this towards maybe um, politics and um, society and thinking about those issues from, yeah, from an active point of view. And that's very exciting, I think. And so one of the um, things we can start looking at is different bodies. And I put here female bodies, but really I refer to all kinds of different bodies. And in the Linguistic Bodies book, we have uh, the whole first part of the book, the first three chapters are or four are about how we are all bodies and different bodies and how we encounter different bodies and how um, um, this idea of the universal body or, or the universal mind, we have to leave it behind and look particularly at how people are situated and what their particular physiology and so on contributes to how they make sense of the world and how we engage with each other with these bodily differences. Um, and one aspect of that is, of course, also, as I mentioned in the beginning, indigenous knowing to understand really that different ways in which differently situated bodies know are their own full kind of knowing, fully valuable because fully um, dealing with values and, and concerns of particular people in particular contexts. And then a meta element of that is to engage with different forms of knowing and to recognize them properly and yet be able to understand something of them, even if um, the way of knowing from which you are looking is not the same. And also to recognize that our um, Western academic way of knowing is also a different way of knowing and to maybe gain some humility 
in our um, way of knowing by being confronted with different ways of knowing. Um, and I think all these issues, and this is something I would like to work out, I mean, all of it is something I'm working out further in the book I'm writing on this topic, but I think in some sense, it turns a lot around intimacy and society and how um, we are, each of us in our particular societies, allowed to have particular kinds of intimate relationships and not so much allowed to have other kinds of intimate relationships. So, um, and this, there is a, a big influence between intimacy and society, between our societal relations and our more, more close relations. Um, yeah, so I think that's a kind of a, a kernel um, element as well around which many things turn and that are interesting to investigate from the point of view of loving and knowing and how they relate with each other. Um, so to conclude, um, loving and knowing, mm, I've talked about it in terms of letting be, which is not a disengaging, nor is it a full determination, but it's an ongoing tension in knowing and loving between being yourself and encountering another as other and how you interact with each other. So both known, knower and known engage, which means that they have no choice but to continually change in this epistem epistemic relationship, which makes it epistemical, ontological, ethical altogether. And so in a way to, to come back to the inactive idea of the life-mind continuity, I think we can interpose loving in the middle of it and say that in order to understand living, um, so the basic elements of living, which even minimal living systems do, all the way to human knowing, to human high intelligence. Um, in order to understand that better, we need to understand the, the tension and the dialectic of loving. And that's, um, that's it. That's wonderful. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so we have um, a couple of people have joined us, although we, we looks like we might just have lost one um, mm -hmm. just as uh, we were finishing up there. So um, Cyril um, Murphy is here from, from UCD. So Cyril, like, um, you can unmute your microphone now um, if uh, you, you wish to do so and if you'd like to ask a, a question. Um, and um, as other week, um, Alex Penn was here for a while. I'm not sure if she's had to fit, um, run off or whether she's just had a connectivity issue and we'll see her again soon. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that was wonderful, Hannah. Um, thanks a million for that. And um, I have a whole host of questions, which I guess we can okay. we'll kick off with some of mine. And if others um, wish to join in, they, they'll be able to do so. So, um, Cyril, if there's issues with the microphones, which seems to happen sometimes, uh, apparently unmuting can, can cause a difficulty, um, you can add a, a, a question into the chat window and I'll articulate it for you. Um, so, Hannah, the, I mean, there's a sort of a whole range of, of sort of issues and things there. Um, but there's sort of a, a couple of questions that seem to sort of to, to particular jump out at me um, has to, to do really with um, the, the sort of some of the details of it, some of the kind of some of the implementations of it mm -hmm. um, and some of its implications for how we actually do science. So the, the methodologies, mm -hmm. um, so for example, one of the questions mm -hmm. that sort of jumped into my mind really was, um, can we do this kind of letting be in the lab? So mm -hmm. while there's a sort of a substantial, I agree with, with the criticism of that there's a, a substantial aspect of way of knowing that is not properly articulated in, in science as it's normally described. Um, the, there is a, a sort of a, an ultimate aim for precision, mm -hmm. which science values um and which does seem to require stepping further than the as we would normally describe this kind of human knowing um so do you think there's a sort of an, an irredeemable tension there that essentially we'll just have to there are certain things we're going to have to let go of <laughs> uh, ironically or is there uh, might there be some way to bring this notion of coordination and precision uh, or sort of precision in coordination with the, the more general 
hmm. um, the, the more general viewpoint of knowing what you're talking about. Yes, that's a good one. I never thought about that before. <laughs> that's really good. Um, mm, so at first sight, there is a, there is a tension between precision and um, human knowing. But I do think that um, in the lab, we have a particular precision that is construed by everything that we've put in place for it to be a lab. And that brings out things that help us predict and explain something within a particular question that we're asking. Um, but sometimes that precision takes us away from what we are investigating. Right, so it drives us towards being precise and to know, for instance, where exactly the mirror neuron is or how it's firing. And yet at the same time, we were looking at human intersubjectivity and um, we may with this precision or this quest for precision have gone towards understanding something that now has become so specified that it actually has made us lose sight of our question of how we understand each other, for instance. So mm -hmm. I think it, it, this could be a meta question for philosophy of science to balance precision and what we are actually looking at. Um, and this depends on what we do further um, with the question we want to answer in a particular experiment. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess it, um, from your answer there, I, um, that makes sense, I guess, in the sense that it, what it does is it um, it challenges us to go for the right kinds of precision. I suppose that um, that there will be certain kinds of precision that are uh, and, and laboratory control, for example, that are achievable, but others that would essentially invalidate things. Um, and I, it, it's almost like a call to be more sensitive to that possibility and to, to treat it more carefully. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed a little bit of what you said just now because I realized I had to switch on my camera again. <laughs> no, just the, um, I, yeah. I, it's, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of re-articulating and making sense of what you said, which may, yeah. makes a lot of sense in essence. It, it's, I mean, mm -hmm. it's an issue that um, psychology is feeling in general at the moment because you're as you'll be yeah. aware of the replication crisis in essence. The, the whole yeah. point is that whatever it is we're doing on the laboratory, we're not, there's something we're not doing right. And for the main part, it's it's being addressed in terms of well, we'll do better statistics, or we'll mm. we'll get more people into the laboratory. Um, but in fact, there's a there's a potentially bigger issue, which has seen some discussion actually in just the last month or so, mm -hmm. uh, that mm. maybe we've been doing theory wrong too. Uh, yeah. which I very much agree with, but it, there's it becomes a question of well, if if we're if we've been doing theory wrong, what have we been doing wrong? And the kinds of blind spot that you've articulated that you've described in your talk seems to, to mm -hmm. get at that very much. Yeah. Uh, but I, like I said, I think it, it introduces an interesting tension um, in the way that we do our our science, which. Yeah. Uh, um, so that it, I guess it it becomes then a, sort of a, a thinking about it a lot in terms of how we think about the specifics of say intercorporeality or and intersubjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, you gave the just as one of your illustrations, you talked about say supporters watching a football match um, as being able to, you know. You can see people, you know, if they're just watching on the sofa, watching a television, they'll jump mm -hmm. off the sofa and scream. And yeah. it's, it's a very much bodily engagement with what's going on. It's not a passive yeah. acceptance of, oh, there are things moving on a, on a flat panel in front of me. Yeah. Um, is that the kind of in, sort of bodily engagement you're talking about? That, you know, what it is, what's happening in the match is something that I am viscerally affected by? Yeah, you're you're moving with it, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So letting be, in a way, is moving with something, moving, and and there also you you go back and forth between um, disengagement or some almost towards disengagement towards uh, engaging a lot, which at the moment when you jump up, for instance, right, and then and then the moment when you think, oh no, I'm not interested anymore, maybe. So the, this it's not just. Um, um, that there are two elements that we have to keep in balance. It's also that we move between 
uh, these forms of engagements all the time. And maybe that also relates to the question about science, this meta question about methodology that we have to be, so this blind spot and the tension between more um, precision and, and being um, engaged with human knowing or thinking about human knowing, we have to, if we are aware of that, I think we can also tune how we relate to what we are doing. For instance, now we are setting up the lab and um, um, calibrating our mechanisms or, or, or doing statistics and um, then having to move back out a little bit and think, what are we actually asking here? So, and that is a very bodily thing that we do, a situated thing when we engage with, with our computer doing the statistics or when we, when we sit back and think, yeah, that is, Inter, yeah, intercorporeal and con and corporeal. We are doing this with our whole moving bodily being. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I guess I'm just, I, you know, if, if I was to sort of put on um, the, the critic's hat and sort of say, mm -hmm. well, what would uh, um, someone coming from a more computational background think here? Mm -hmm. and they might sort of make the argument, well, when it comes to something like a uh, um, engaging in a, you know watching a football match that in fact my bodily engagement with that match is probably better described by a simulation theory than it is by something more immediately embodied um, and I'm trying to I guess I'm wondering what the what you think of the what what you think the the misunderstanding is there or the misapprehension is yeah, in the in the simulation theory. Okay, yeah. So then you would be simulating um, what the other is doing in your own body, but then you have to. Then the question is, how do you then engage with it again, or or how do you get out of your own system to relate with what's going on? It it I think simulation theory tends to um, go towards just one side of it, which remains internal. Or could rem or is in danger of remaining internal, and then being in need of the, of explaining um, where is the engagement there. So it's it's um, the I guess so me as the as the the uh, the, uh, the sport I'm not a terribly big football fan so I, I kind of I'm working off what I what I understand football fandom to involve. <laughs> then normally when I'm watching a, a football match I don't know an awful lot of what's going on and my friends are kind of. They're seeing yeah. an entirely different match to me, but as a result, yeah. they are engaged with in a way that I can't. Right? So yeah. yeah. Um, but it, I guess, it arises mm -hmm. from um, from that um, sort of capacity for their behavior mm -hmm. to match or coordinate with what's going on, rather than just them. Able, well, I can see mm -hmm. the movements of the players just as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I can't follow those movements in in the same way. Yeah. And in so that there's. Sense, Sorry, go on. Yeah, this has been shown before as well, right? That the, the, the kinds of capacities you have as an embodied being, which is also as a thinker or as an understander of, of rules of sports, means that you can engage in particular ways and not so much in other ways. The more you familiar you are with it or the more you know, the more you can engage in that particular way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, mm. So there was um, sort of one other. And this one's a biggie. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, the well, I, I I'll go for a smaller one before I go for a bigger one, I suppose, which has okay. to do with just and it's a kind of a nitpick, but it, I guess I just want to draw out one of the aspects of your description of loving, yeah, um, a little bit more, um, which is at one point you describe it as inescapable, hmm. um, and I I would have almost thought that. The, Love is more fragile than that. That that, um, mm -hmm. and I don't just mean it in terms of the romantic love, but it that there because over determination or disengagement are so easy to do mm -hmm. that the in what way is, is what what did you mean by the term inescapable? I guess is is in what way is is that inescapable this manifest? Yeah. So. Um... In a way, what I want to do with the loving notion is to talk about our conatus, uh, in a way, with Spinoza's idea of the conatus, and also Jonas talks about concern that a living being has for what they interact with. So I think I call it inescapable because we are always concerned as living beings 
we always are engaged with what concern us, concerns us. And so for me, it's almost, when I think about it, I, I, it's hard to put into words, but I feel like a, I, there is a connection from the very center of the living being um, that it can never stop because if it would stop making this concerned connection with the world, it would be dead or it would die. So that's the sort of individual, related to the individual aspect of loving that I want to exp explain with this. And it's um, the basic connection of the living being with the world in terms of its, of its life impulse or basic living concern. Um, yeah. It, um, sorry. To, um, so it's insofar as my living requires me to know my world, and knowing well means at least love of some kind, um, some kind of responsive, um, letting be relationship. Then, in essence, knowing re requires loving in some yeah. way. Is that right? And, and insofar as my life needs me to know, then. Yeah. My life needs me to love. Yes, yes, yes. I, I want to say that loving and knowing are the same thing in some sense, in a particular sense, that they are both this tension between being this concernful being that interacts completely from that concern with the world and then is confronted with things that are different and that it has to deal with uh, in order to deal with this concern. And so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that we can't go behind. That's that's, and so yes, knowing is that. And of course, a lot of detail needs to be worked out there. It's 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 the beginning of an idea, right? Yeah. 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 Um, absolutely. So, well, I guess that leads me in very nicely, actually, to mm -hmm. the, the big question that I um, mm -hmm. that I wanted to raise, um, which has to do then with um, the notion of norms and that. So obviously norms play sort of a big role in an active thinking in general. And um, there's some attention's too strong a word, I think, between the um, but there there's sort of a, a few different ways in which the concept of norms is um, unpacked um sort of very frequently in terms of either autopoetic or at least autonomous dynamics mm -hmm. uh, of some kind. And um so in so far as the, if I'm understanding how you're using the concept of loving um, properly, which I'm probably not, but I'm being put straight will be very useful. Um, mm -hmm. There will always be, in essence, so there's there's my norms, my concerns, as you've put them, um, mm -hmm. and whatever it is the universe are, and, and environment around me have, there will be norms. So um, there'll be other mm -hmm. people, and there'll just be the 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 inherent dynamics of the the world around me that I need to get into the flow with mm -hmm. to know and love effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any sort of particular, and I guess the one of the issues then is overdetermination is when I violate the norms of the, say, the other person I'm interacting with, where I, I cease to treat mm -hmm. them as some, of something, someone uh, of value mm -hmm. and essentially crush them or violate their norms in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a particular conception of norm um, that's in play, or is this a very wide generic concept? Or do you have a, a sort of specific notion of, of norm that you you think we should be paying attention mm -hmm. to in mind? Yeah, I haven't really thought about it in, in terms of norms, and not, not using that particular term. But the way you described it is quite um, adequate, I think. Um, Yes. Um, oh, yeah, I tend not to think about things in terms of norms so much. Mm. Okay. So I thought there was something at one point, um, because I think partly it had to do with your description of when you were talking about participatory sense making. Mm -hmm. um, and there was you talked about the in, important to understand better the interactive and individual normativity and self-organization of play yes yes and i guess it's that yeah um that notion of normativity yeah um is um is that just a kind of autonomous dynamics in the social interaction um or is there a 
Yeah, to begin with, it, it is that. It is the norms of a living system that, that are always to do with their particular physiology and, and, um, and embodiment. So a creature comes to the world with their own particular norms and self-organization and then encounters the world indeed, which uh, has its own norms, but specifically when it's another living being that we encounter, the norms are also coming from this intrinsic concern that, that the other um, person or creature has. And so then we have to um, uh, engage with them. And then as with participatory sense making, one of the basic elements is that the interaction we engage in with another um, a norm, normful creature, normative creature, uh, will also take on its own normativity, right? An interaction also generates um, ways in which we can interact and, and precludes other ways in which we can interact from the dynamics of the interaction process itself. So we don't only deal with each other's norms, or my own and the others, but also with the norms of how we can engage. And that's also something maybe that relates to the final part about in the relation between intimacy and society. So thinking about um, how we can or are allowed to engage with each other influences how we are also our own normativity. So that means that um, when we engage with something in, in a scientific endeavor or in, in a societal question, like how to deal with prisoners, um, it changes us. So if we live in a society where it's okay to, to put people in solitary confinement for weeks on end, um, and we take out the rotten apples, so to speak, and put them, separate them, this changes how we, as, a, as participants in that society, deal with each other. So we, we, for us, it's okay to have this divisive, oper or maybe not, we also can fight against it, but at least we live in a society where this is a, a norm, and we, we have to, um, um, have a, an attitude towards that. We can go with it or we can um, fight it, but we have to fight it in particular ways because this is the particular normativity of society that says how we here deal with others or with, with, with everybody, with people. So yeah, these normativities deeply um, go into even our physiology, I think. I mean, uh, the prison example maybe isn't so clear from, from the people who are not in prison, but when you are in prison, put into solitary confinement, this changes your physiological um, being. It's, it's psychologically detrimental to be in solitary confinement, also, but also physiologically. And then after you come out, this changes how you deal with um, the people around you and how they can deal with you. And so the normativities are coming from this intrinsic concern, from, from how we organize society, and they reach into each other very deeply, I think. That's maybe one of the points I want to make, more deeply than we generally tend to think, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, um, that's, that makes things clearer, I think. But, mm -hmm. So there's actually, there's a, a couple of questions that have been posted to um, YouTube there from uh, Mark James, so yeah, I can um, articulate those if, if you don't mind. So yeah. um, Mark asks, is just in terms of, um, you mentioned that letting be seems to describe something akin to a, a spiritual or meditative practice, essentially some kind of skilled practice. Um, how does one know when one is letting be in the way prescribed? Yeah, that's oh, that's a very good question too, yes. Um, hmm. oh, there is so much to say about that. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Hmm. Um, for now, I don't really want to say something about that yet because I want to work it out further before I, I say something. Okay. It's it's going to be part of the book, hmm. but so I, I, I it'll hmm. it'll probably need the kinds of structure of of learning and development that um, such kinds of of mindful practices. Yeah, in some sense, I want to say that we all know it because even I mean we we humans have interested very sophisticated intricate intersubjective experience from the beginning of life, even before being born. In utero, there is intersubjective um, connections going on. If you, you know, depends on how you describe it and define all of it, of course, but we are intersubjectively sensitive from very, very early. And so we have capacities for letting be from very, very, very young. And we develop them um, in our particular situations, which will um, have an influence on how we can let be. 
So everybody has this expertise, I think, and at least a lot of experience with it. But it's true that um, particular um, sorts of training, like uh, meditative training, um, but also other trainings, I think, can help us become more sensitive. Mm. But it's not just saying that meditation will help with that and that's it. Uh, I, we also have to be a little bit careful with that because ways in which people medit or in, in which meditation is conceived can also help you unlearn a certain sensitivity of letting be and or 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 put you in a particular frame where you have certain values with it that um, leave by the wayside other aspects of letting be. So that's a, it's a very um, um, uh, tricky thing to just say something about quickly. But I, for, for sure, I see a connection. And I think, yeah, many, almost all the places in the world and all, all the people in history and, and all over the world have engaged in these kinds of practices. I think it's, it's something very human that we do. And this definitely plays a role. And training it is valuable. But yeah, I, I need to say something about it. I guess from from what you're saying there, it just makes me think about one of the you know one of these sort of really basic facts about skill development in general is that it never yeah. generalizes, not nowhere near as much as we'd like. So yeah. and if we think of in any situation in which I'm a skilled practitioner, then I am able to let that domain be. But there are other areas of my life that I don't let be at all. Yes. Uh, and yes. wander through. Um, yes. So it, it, there's there's probably a really wide variety of ways of. Yeah. Uh, Yes, and an important lesson from that is to stay humble, I think. Even if you practice, even if you train, even if you are... So uh, the more and more I research this, the more I think I have to... I, uh, yeah, that, that humility is very important. But also not too much, because then, then you're letting things determine you maybe too much. So yeah, it's, it's, not, it's always a balancing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No easy answers. Mm. No, no I, <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> That'd be a hard sell. Um, Mark mm -hmm. notes that the, some of the issues of this in politics has been addressed in a book called The Listening Society. Have you, have you ah. come across that? No. Um, there seems to be a, a so-called meta-modern approach to politics. Ah, nice. Um, so it might have a kind of a interesting contribution to make to um, great and politically oriented activism. Yeah, cool. I will. Uh, I noted it down. I will look it up. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I mean, at this point, I think we've been um, running a starting to, to run over time. So I don't want to um, keep you too long, but I'm very grateful mm -hmm. for um, the seminar and for the, for the discussion following. Yeah, um, me too. And and so thanks very much for mm -hmm. um, for the talk and for the discussion. Um, Thank you. I will remind you and um, anyone who comes across the video that the discussion can continue as well, um, possibly on the, the discussion forum on the answerseminars.com, mm -hmm. the, the page for your talk there. So okay. keep, keep a weather eye on that and we'll see how things go. Yeah, great. Thank you, Marek. So thanks very much, Anne. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll um, see everyone again for a, an, another answer seminar in the future. <laughs>